Okay, so just while we're loading up, um, morning everyone. Um, great to see you all. Um, so as president of the society, it's particularly uh, great for me to be able to welcome everybody here. I particularly like to welcome all of the officers and members of the Richard III Society. I can see you all from here. It's the largest audience I've ever spoken in front of, would you believe? But actually, I should also thank everybody from my own, the Mortimer History Society, for the tremendous organisation of today. Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Driver. I'm president of the Mortimer History Society. So it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to Ludlow today for our conference. Now, I'm in the fortunate position that I'm dealing with a relatively uncontroversial topic in that I'm not talking about Richard III, I'm not talking about the Yorkists, and I'm not even talking about the 15th century. My talk today really concentrates on the transition from a period of real problems for the Mortimer family with the execution of the first Earl of March in 1330 to their re-establishment of the earldom in 1354 and the re-establishment of the family as one of the leading aristocratic powers in England through Roger Mortimer II Earl, the first Earl's grandson, and his military career, his close friendship with the King Edward III and his son, the Black Prince, but also the work of Roger's mother, Elizabeth, and his grandmother, Joan Mortimer, the widow of the First Earl of March, who were able to secure the inheritance for their grandson in the 1330s and 1340s. And I'll be looking at some of the processes which they used, some of the strategies to ensure that Roger was able to inherit the earldom intact in 1354. So I'm going to kick off now without further ado. Uh, so, um, in his account for the years 1332 to 4, Walter Weston, clerk of works at the Tower of London, claimed 12 pence, which is around two days' wages for a skilled uh, tradesman, against the 19th of October 1332 for the cartage and carriage of 12 cartloads of Rygate and Rag stone, which were used for the sale of Lord Roger Mortimer, Geoffrey his son, and Simon de Bereford in the tower next to the King's Chamber, from that tower as far as the King's Garden. And I know you can't see this at the back room at the front, but the box that's in red on my uh, slide there is actually the Latin of that uh, particular record, which is at the National Archives. Now, tucked away among payments of wages to masons and carpenters, this cell symbolised in stone, tile and mortar a dramatic shift in power in England. It had been erected in haste following the coup at Nottingham Castle on the 19th of October 1330, uh, where the teenage king, Ebba III, and a group of hand-picked friends arrested Mortimer, first Earl of March, probable lover of Isabella, the Queen Mother, and the real power behind the English throne, by accessing tunnels, which you can see here, under the castle, and surprising the couple in the Queen's bedchamber. Uh, that is the Queen, as you can see. There she is in all her glory. If anybody's got that novel, by the way, I wouldn't mind borrowing it. Uh, now... This cell enabled King Edward to watch over his captives and so end Mortimer's four-year rule over the kingdom. Understandable, given Roger's somewhat miraculous escape from the tower seven years earlier, where he had drugged his jailers and escaped by means of a smuggled-in rope ladder. Now, extracted from this makeshift prison on the 29th of November 1330, Earl Roger was condemned in Parliament for treason and various personal, political and moral offences. Now, I'd hope to show an image of the Parliament role on which those offences are given, but it's absolutely manky, it's horrible, so I haven't got that. But if you want to, there is a transcript available on the Parliament Rolls of Medieval England website, which you'll be able to access um, from like, good university libraries. Oops, there we go. Again, you won't, sorry, you won't be able to see that, but there are the charges. So anybody who wants to see them, go onto the podcast when it's available online. Now, the offences included encroaching royal power, extracting ransoms contrary to Magna Carta, as well as misappropriating war reparations from the Scots, making war on the king's advisers, and deceiving the king's uncle, the Earl of Kent, into believing that his brother, the late King Edward II, was still alive, in order to bring about Kent's death. Worst of all, he had, and I quote here from the record, falsely and maliciously sown discord between the late king and queen. Now, Roger was dragged to Tyburn to be hanged like a common criminal, his body was left to hang for two days until it was cut down by local Franciscan friars. Now, while his execution restored royal majesty and ushered in England's most successful medieval reign, that of the great man Edward III, it also had potential as collateral damage to destroy a family whose land holdings across England, Ireland and the Welsh marches, access to favourable marriage alliances and patronage in the reigns of the three Edwards, 
had seen them rise from baronial status to the apex of nobility. Now, among the accusations levelled against Mortimer was that he had, he had compelled the king to create him Earl of March in October 1328 to the crown's loss. Now, certainly that title was Mortimer's invention, and it made a play for authority over not only the jurisdictionally semi-independent March of Lordships of Wales, where he was Lord of Wigmore, and Ludlow, Chirk, and Denby, but also a valuable lands in Ireland centred on the Liberty of Trim, northwest of Dublin. Anybody who's been there, it's, a, it's an amazing castle. Now, it thereby menaced both royal and aristocratic power on the fringes of the English king's dominions. It might be natural to assume that the commodal title, which many saw as unprecedented at the time, would be abolished and would not pass to his 20-something heir, Edmund. Now, this view is reinforced by the creation and destruction, on grounds of treason, of the earldom of Carlisle and the annulment of the earldoms of Cornwall and Winchester in the previous reign. So they would no longer be vested in the families of Piers Gaveston or Hugh Dispenser the Elder, the royal favourites. Also, the wider Mortimer family had benefited from the first Earl's period in power. So Roger had manipulated the king into giving him, his children and associates royal castles, towns and manors across the British Isles. But this became moot upon Edmund Mortimer's premature death in late uh, December 1331, leaving his three-year-old heir, Roger, to uphold the, the barely flickering Mortimer torch. Ill repute, long minority, forfeiture, and the long lives of three successive generations of widows, whose dower settlements fragmented Mortimer Lordship over half a century, imperiled the status and vitality of an important bulwark of English Lordship throughout these islands. And yet, within 30 years, upon the death in 1360 of young Roger, by then second Earl of March, the family had restored the title, their pristine, pristine status and prestige, and had married into the immediate royal family of Edward III. So this morning I want to explore how Fortune's wheel was turned so quickly and so dramatically. Now much credit, of course, goes to the personality and military prowess of the second Earl, which earned him the affection of Edward III, exemplified in Roger's adoption into the chivalric order of the Garter in 1348, even though he was underage. But the convergence of Edward III's political pragmatism, where his willingness to forge a new nobility convinced him to forgive indiscretions of previous generations, with the determination of strong Mortimer women to control the inheritance, secured the future of the dynasty and ensured it could once more flourish and reach new heights. So, in a proclamation of the 20th of October 1330, the day after his coup, Edward III announced that he will henceforth govern according to right and reason, as befits his royal dignity, and that affairs touching him and the estate of his realm shall be directed by the common council of the magnates. Now those wishing to air grievances were called to Parliament, and the forfeiture and survey of the lands of Roger Mortimer and his accomplices was ordered. Edward then moved to dismantle Mortimer's power base in Wales and its marches, and to wrest control back into royal hands. Now, two months on, Edward committed the custody of Drisluan Castle in Carmarthenshire and the stewardship of his domain lord, uh, domain lordship of Cantor of Mawr, which uh, Mortimer had run as Justice of Wales from 1327, to Rhys of Griffith, one of Edward II's chief native Welsh uh, lieutenants. And that was pursued by an order of the 6th of January to the new Justices of Wales to take information concerning the state of Wales, how offices were held there um, in Edward I's reign, to whom they had subsequently been co uh, committed and whether that was being for good service or not. And over the following weeks and months, new royal custodians were found for Mortimer's Herefordshire manors of Marden, Bredward, Iron and Winferton, which, um, who, were to, um, who were to manage them for the king's profit. Similarly, the parson of Hopesay in Shropshire kept the Welsh lordships of Malyeneth and Cudawine, as well as the lordship of Chirk, which Mortimer had appropriated following the death of his uncle in 1326 for an annual render of 200 marks, which is around 166 pounds. And here we have Chirk. Now, by the 24th of March, the decision had been made to annex Chirk to the Crown forever, in response to a petition to the Council and a fine of 200 marks. Chirk would in time be granted to Richard Fitzalan, the new Earl of Arundel, the principal rival dynasty to the Mortimers in the Middle March. And this suggests that Edward wished to bolster non-Mortimer power in the region to prevent such wide-ranging individual power blocks being reconstructed. Now, in essence, however, Edward's promise to govern by right and reason translated into a remarkably lenient settlement for the wider, wider Mortimer family. It provided a platform and new connections for recovery of honour, reputation and prestige. 
while using Mortimer lands and offices for patronage. Within days of his arrest, Roger Mortimer's widow, Joan, who had been silently cuckolded during the previous four years, her ladies and her children, were protected from the general survey of her husband's forfeited estates. Her expenses and those of her children at Ludlow were met from Roger's goods. By mid-January 1331, she had received her own inheritance lands at Mansell Lacey, Wolfalo, US Lacey and Walterston in Herefordshire, Stanton Lacey and Ludlow in Shropshire. Now, she was allowed to do homage to the king in person for her lordship of Trim, rather than travel to Ireland. Her eldest son, Edmund, meanwhile, was restored in October 1331 to the bulk of his inheritance in the marches, following a lengthy process of petition and inquiry. Edmund requested delivery of the castle and manor of Wigmore, the lordships of Malieneth, Cadawine, and Cymuthdaiver with their castles, and those, they, these were due to him, he claimed, but in fiefment to use of 1316, securing succession on Roger Mortimer's male heirs, and in default to Edmund and his heirs in tail. And here we have that settlement replete with its 24 seals. Now, this had been the settlement made by Roger upon his son's marriage to Elizabeth, daughter of the royal steward Bartholomew Battlesmere, and Edmund had argued he had not ceded his right therein to his father or to anyone else. And these principles of inheritance having been settled, Edmund Mortimer succumbed to an unknown illness at Stanton Lacey on the 16th of December 1331. The Mortimer family chronicler, writing in Latin in the 1380s, remembered Edmund as having, and I quote, recovered by sense and probity the lands awarded to him and his wife, which had been unjustly taken from him by the death of his father. Now, unfortunately, the actual manuscripts in the University of Chicago, and trying to get images is not easy. Now, Edmund's premature death created another major crisis, as the family had just achieved, achieved a measure of equilibrium. However, Edmund's mother and wife would support, whether deliberate or intentional, or sorry, incidental from the Crown, which is trickier to work out, employed various strategies to hold the multiple strands of the inheritance of the Earl of March together. So our late, son's, um, our late son Edmund's lands having been restored in, um, resumed, sorry, in January 1332, Joan Mortimer petitioned King and Council in the following June for custody, the heir being a minor in the, uh, now in the King's ward, as, and I quote, the land suffered great damage in the King's hand. Now, the King ordered delivery, but it appears to have been frustrated, and this was an experience that poor Joan would see repeated in her Herculean one-woman efforts, both to restore the body of her late husband to the family mausoleum at Wigmore, and to keep control of her liberty of trip. Uh, now, in, in, an unda in undated petitions of 1332, Joan presented numerous requests. She asked again for custody of her son's lands due to their being wasted. She requested regard from her husband's lands in aid of her sustenance, as her once valuable inheritance lands in Ireland were destroyed by the king's Irish enemies. She hoped she might have livery of her lands of trim while awaiting the king's decision upon her right. And finally, she pleaded for livery of her husband's corpse for a proper burial. The king having ordered it to be, delivered to, um, to, to be delivered, but the Franciscans of Coventry refusing to comply. Now, in response, the king noted that his grant of livery to Edmund had been made on condition of regard. He ordered the chief governor of Ireland to be informed about Trim. But, with regard to the corpse, the king was heavily influenced by his mother, Queen Isabella. He ordered it to be left to lie in peace again. And here's what you have in French, demurge le corps en paix encore, let the body lie in peace again. So, following his execution, Roger Mortimer's body had been spirited away by the Franciscans of London to their brethren in Coventry, where Isabella exercised personal jurisdiction and could potentially offer private devotion. An order of the 7th of November 1331, in response to a joint petition from Joan and her eldest son to the Coventry Friars to restore the body, had been willfully ignored. And there is indeed no record evidence of Roger's body being removed to Wigmore, a royally condoned slight to family honour and memorial practice. Now, with regard to Trim, this was a more pressing financial and political concerns for Joan, and she faced an uphill struggle to reassert personal control over the liberty and a legal challenge from her distant relatives. Hugh de Lacey, who claimed ancestral rights over Trim through the same inheritance from the Marshal Lords of Leinster as did Joan, as well as lands at Rathwire in Meath, forfeited in 1318 at the record of Roger Mortimer when he was King's Lieutenant of Ireland, launched a campaign to recover his rights, and he stressed the injustice of his forfeiture through Mortimer's covetousness. 
Lacey had been outlawed and exiled, but had received a safe conduct from the King to pursue its case. A writ of the 7th of April 1332 ordered inquiry in Ireland into de Lacey's impeachment for, and I quote, certain felonies and trespasses which Roger pretended he had done. Meanwhile, over two years, Joan struggled to get recognition that the original forfeiture of her lordship, awarded by royal justices in the mid-1320s, while she and her husband languished in jail, had been erroneous, on the grounds that their right to hold royal pleas at Trim could not be justified by quo warranto proceedings, which were basically an investigation to establish by what warrant uh, lands or particular privileges were held. And despite in 1327 having reversed this judgment, it was then challenged as this reversal had been made before the new king had come to full power. Nonetheless, on the 14th of September 1332, orders were issued for restoration, Joan having successfully argued before the king and his council. Joan, though, was now in her mid-40s, her advancing age, these tribulations, and the indignity she'd undoubtedly suffered in being physically imprisoned in the 1320s and emotionally imprisoned um, by her late husband's relationship with the Queen Mother perhaps explain some otherwise confusing behaviour. At some point in the early 1330s, Joan attempted to divest herself of her lands and endow them on her second son, Geoffrey. Now, controversial figure, Geoffrey had been arrested and imprisoned with his father in 1330. He was on that first slide I showed you. He'd also been permitted to travel overseas early in 1331, having promised not to make unlawful assemblies. Geoffrey was, however unsettlingly, next in line after young Roger to the Mortimer succession. And presumably Joan, who had witnessed her eldest son's premature death and the death of her grandchild, John, the infant younger brother of Roger, the toddler heir to the Mortimer title, wanted to shore up this succession. <coughs> Geoffrey, though, appears not to have resided in England and instead claimed the French Lord of the Cure. So this may best be seen then in the context of a grand maternal care for young Roger and aspirations shared by the Crown to re-establish him among the front rank of the nobility, but possibly also to reassert herself against her daughter-in-law Elizabeth and her new husband. Geoffrey indeed reappeared in England in 1337 as Elizabeth began to manoeuvre. Now young Roger, the second Earl, eventually we'll get to him, had been born in Ludlow Castle in November 1328, where his mother Elizabeth, aged around 16 when she'd given birth, had been living with Joan. And there's no evidence to suggest that Elizabeth or Roger left that care during his infancy. Now, following her husband's death, Elizabeth received custody of her dower with right to sue for those lands not contained in the grant, while Joan initially received wardship of the other two thirds and licence to retain Cadawine and Dolphorwin Castle, which she had acquired for life from her son before his death. Early in 1333, Elizabeth received custody at £230 a year of Wigmore and those other lands recently committed to Joan. Now, this might represent an attempt to stabilise the landed inheritance of the Mortimer family of Wigmore by two of its matriarchs, with provision being made for the young heir in endowing his mother with custody. For Joan, that perhaps stimulated her to concentrate her efforts on her Irish liberty and on Ludlow, so that they could eventually also be passed on to Roger, intact. That she faced considerable difficulty is highlighted by another order of January 1337, her restoration of her liberty. Now, political rapprochements could also be made in other ways. The leading modern biographer of Edward III, Professor Mark Ormrod of the University of York, has commented in discussing Edward's treatment of the Mortimer family in the 1330s that, and I quote, in a more pragmatic sense, Edward III also quickly realised that women were the key to the general process of reconciliation. In 1335, Elizabeth Mortimer was betrothed to William de Boone, for a future Earl of Northampton. Not only was this clearly not a disparaging union, it aimed, as a dispensation from Pope Benedict XII declared, to heal the enmity between the two families. William was one of the young men handpicked by the King to arrest Mortimer in 1330, and he and his brothers had suffered during Roger's ascendancy. So that marriage gave Elizabeth and her son new powerful connections. And it's around this time that we find Roger Mortimer the Younger first mentioned as a minor in the King's ward. And in 1336, William Montague, Earl of Salisbury, who was the chief co-conspirator in the Nottingham coup of 1330, procured his marriage. Now, Roger soon found himself in the household of the king's eldest son, Edward of Woodstock, the Black Prince, two years his junior. And there he received the rudiments of a scholarly education, learned something of manorial lordship and the skills required for war from his tutor, Master Nicholas of Otterburn. And it was here that Roger made the greatest impression 
Both king and prince sought to promote him as in recognition of the service he provided. But also his new stepfather cultivated royal favour in their mutual interests. So as Roger moved into his 14th year and into adolescence in 1342, the king, intriguingly, granted him, as son and heir of Edmund Mortimer, Earl of March, lands in Radnor, Knighton and Norton, later of his redoubtable great-grandmother, Margaret, mother of the, of the first Earl of March, who had actually died only in 1334. And he was to hold them until his lawful age for an annual rent of £250, although revealingly, keepers were to be deputed by Bartholomew Burkirsch, who was the master of the Black Prince's household. Now, the deal was negotiated by his stepfather, William de Boone, for a huge bond of £4,000, payable in Chancery, though subsequently that was remitted. And a separate commitment to Roger in the same year of the seat of his ancestral lordship of Wigmore was made at de Boone's request. William, having previously been permitted to farm the castle and having performed homage to Edward on his stepson's behalf. So for a dozen years, the king and the Mortimer matriarchs had striven and continued to strive to ensure territorial coherence and continuity, and that the Mortimer family might once again return to prestige and favour. And it would, as perhaps is best known, be the military prowess, royal service and personal relationship with the king of Roger Mortimer, the second earl, which finally re-established the preeminence of his dynasty. Now I'm obviously going to have to give a potted narrative here, so bear with me for racing through some material. But Roger first, attracted, yeah, Roger first attracted public attention by outperforming many of his peers in a tournament at Hereford in 1344. But the real worth of the crown was demonstrated in the continental campaigns by which Edward III asserted his claim to the throne of France. So knighted before his 18th birthday by the Black Prince, Roger fought in the vanguard of the victorious English army at Cressy in August 1346 with 200 men from Wigmore and Radnor. This laudable service earned him delivery of his lands in Herefordshire and the Welsh marches 10 days later. Early in 1350, Roger found himself secreted in the Calais Gatehouse with the King, the Prince and a small group of household retainers in order to foil Geoffroy de Charny's attempt to recapture the town, which had been taken in 1346 by the English. Now, Roger enjoyed the King's personal trust and was at the heart of Edward's most sensitive missions. Two years on, following the breach of an Anglo-French truce, Roger, his stepfather, his uncle Thomas de Beauchamp, Earl of Warwick, and other senior earls led a force of 9,000 men, including men from Roger's Welsh estates, to attack northern France. And finally, Roger was to act as constable of the English army in 1359, during Edward's final campaign to capture Reims, heart of French sacral kingship, where Edward hoped to be crowned in the cathedral. Personally fronting an expeditionary force of 61 knights, 232 squires and 300 archers, as Matt Raven has recently revealed, Roger engaged in a raiding on the Channel coast, successfully bailing it up in an, an, an ultimately fruitless and fatal winter campaign. Now, Roger Mortimer became a mainstay and leader of the English military machine throughout the late 1340s and 1350s. And he also epitomised the new nobility of young men not associated with the civil conflicts of the past, now prominent at the court of Edward III and the team culture of which the historian Richard Barber has recently written. Now this culture and Roger's position within it was crystallized by the foundation in 1348 of the Order of the Garter. Now principally seen as an expression of Edward's cult of chivalry and military meritocracy, which displayed the full theatricality of English royal majesty, Richard Barber has argued that the order was more of a small, closed religious fraternity of like-minded individuals. Now certainly, while evidence abounds that Roger shared the military and theatrical mindset of the king, they may also have had some close spiritual ties. Now in autumn 1353, Edward seems to have made an unusual detour to visit the Church of St Mary Magdalene Lentwood in Herefordshire, which was of Joan Mortimer's patronage, or at least a member of his household did. Now, there appears, there, there appears to be two separate offerings were made before the image of the Virgin, and here's the account book which again is at the National Archives. And there's the first entry. Um, it's um, offerings made before the image of the Virgin. And there's also a cloth of gold, which is deposited, which is worth 100 shillings in the bottom there. Now, almost a quarter of a century previously, Roger Mortimer, first Earl of March, had founded a chantry at Lembodine in honor of the Virgin, in order for prayers for himself, his wife, the king, king's wife and mother, and their children and successors to be made. 
Now, Ian Mortimer, who sadly can't be with us today, has ingeniously speculated that this may have been the burial place for an infant or stillborn half-brother of the king. Now, this, of course, is unprovable, and I'm not going to prove it today. But a visit to the recently completed chantry, chantry may have marked for Edward reconciliation with the family whose head had so aggrieved him during his teenage years and who had pr and probably ordered the murder of his late father, Edward II. And I know that's controversial. Now, whatever the truth, this visit presaged by a few months the full restoration of, of, to Roger Jr. of the title of Earl of March. In April 1354, the King in Parliament annulled the judgment against his grandfather. The King disingenuously claimed the original sentence had been invalid. The correct legal procedures over which he, of course, had actually presided had not been observed in that Mortimer had not spoken in his own defence. Now, taken together, the evidence of the previous two decades and chronicle accounts suggest that Edward had long intended this course of action. The Wigmore Chronicler refutes the witness of others who apparently correctly claim that Edmund Mortimer, Roger's father, had never been Earl, copying out the Charter of the 6th of September 1341, by which the King granted Nucleus and Pilloth to the Earl of Northampton and his wife Elizabeth, quote, who was the wife of Edmund de Mortu Omari, formerly Earl of March. Now, certainly Joan Mortimer had been consistently referred to as Countess of March in the Irish context in the 1330s, and we can, I think, assume Edward never intended to quash the title with a viable and innocent male heir. That would be a precedent too far. Now, Mark Ormrod, the biographer of Edward III, has commented that this award, quote, signalled in particularly dramatic form Edward III's resolve to transcend the factualism of the 1320s and honour the new generation of young lords who had become some of his principal commanders and councillors. <laughs> now, the judgment restored the second earl to all of his grandfather's estates. These included the liberty of Trim and seven other Irish manors, which his grandmother Joan had exchanged in June 1347 for life custody of properties in Worcestershire, Herefordshire and Radnorshire. And the exchange was made shortly after the king ordered another delivery of Trim. Joan had fought apparently in vain for 17 years for livery of her lordship. Another grant of May 1342, in which the king promised her liberty would not be taken into his hands during her life without just and reasonable cause, and fair warning had also never been honoured. The increasing maturity and prominence of her grandson and the desire to endow him with a full inheritance must have persuaded her to cut her losses. Joan, who I think is possibly one of the most impressive and important figures in the Mortimer history, died aged 70 in October 1356. In practical terms, that allowed young Roger to take control of her Lordship of Ludlow. It added the Lordship of Mylianeth and other English manors bequeathed to him upon the, the death of Elizabeth, his mother, the previous June. So within four months, the main branch of the Mortimer family had lost its two most experienced matriarchs. Both women had devoted the greater part of their lives to preserving and consolidating the inheritance they would leave to their son and grandson and to restoring the Mortimer name. Now, much of their activities are sadly hidden from us through lack of sources. We've almost no knowledge of their networks. There's, for example, disappointingly little evidence of how Joan interacted with her daughters, who were married to some of the most revered comical and baronial families in England. Conversely, military service, of course, brought Roger into contact with his uncle, Thomas Earl of Warwick, and members of the Barclay family, of which his aunt Margaret was a key figure. But it was the new networks forged by Edward III and the Black Prince for his charge that principally shaped the future of, of, of the second Earl and his progeny. Before 1352, Roger married Philippa, daughter of William Montague, second Earl of Salisbury. Philippa's grandfather, William, had been the chief architect and beneficiary of Edward's coup against Roger Mortimer in 1330 gaining thereby the Lordship of Denby. But the King was on personal, better personal terms with the soon to be Earl of March and proceeded with the connivance of the Earl of, Arund Earl of Arundel, who had cut a favourable deal to return temporarily the Lordship of Church to, to, to Mortimer, to exclude the second Montague Earl from Denby by judgment in the King's bench, about which uh, Professor Gibbon Wilson has written the most detailed account. That Edward could to some act so arbitrarily is testament to the nature of the personal favour he showed to Roger. Now, Edward was left bereft by um, Mortimer's unexpected death, aged only 31, on campaign in February 1360. Um, the king arranged something akin to a state funeral for Roger at Windsor, the home of the Order of the Garter, where he offered seven cloths of gold uh, worth almost £40 of his special arms, which you can see. Yeah. Um, there could also have been... Um, cause for concern that with only a seven-year-old heir, Edmund, who had been born in February 1352, another prolonged minority awaited the Mortimer family. 
However, in 1357, the king had betrothed the young Edmund to Philippa, daughter of his second son, Lionel of Clarence, heiress to the Earldom of Ulster, and lordship of Connacht. And here we bring in the Yorkist line. The marriage would eventually take place in 1368. and overrode an agreement of November 1354 for Edmund to marry Alice, daughter of the Earl of Arundel. The king compensated Roger in £2,000 for the breach of that agreement with Arundel. And in 1359, Roger enfiefed some estates, including Ludlow and Cleavery, upon a group of friends and counsellors led by the Bishop of Winchester, William of Wickham, to use during his heir's minority. These arrangements brought the Mortimers into the inner circle of, a ro of in a royal circle of Edward III, and as Chris has argued, made them the greatest landowners in England outside of the royal family. That had been the ambition of Roger Mortimer, first Earl of March. His acquisitiveness and tyrannical behaviour brought shame and potential ruin upon the family. But, by way of conclusion, the fortitude of successive generations of Mortimer matriarchs and their desire to provide stability and coherence in the maintenance of a territorial inheritance, fused with the political pragmatism and personality of the King and the Second Earl, allowed the Mortimer family to become symbols of reconciliation and in a position to dominate landholding in England, Wales and Ireland for a further three generations. Now, for more on the Second Earl himself, I wholeheartedly recommend you pick up a copy of the second issue of our Mortimer History Society Journal, where you'll find a really detailed prize-winning account of his life by Matt Raven, to whom I'm now going to hand over to take the Mortimer story further. Thank you. Thank you.